Okay, so uh, yeah, we, we're extremely happy today to have uh, Xiaolong Liu to, to talk about the pure density wave uh, in the uh, the new exotic superconductor of uranium ditorite. Yeah, so I, I read his uh, preprint on, on the archive and I feel fascinated about this result. So yeah, uh, it's all okay. yours. Uh, yeah, so please, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Peng Chong, for the uh, invitation and kind of introduction. Uh, yeah. I should have realized that most of the audience will be more uh, interested in the in the UTE2 study, uh, but just for the completeness of the story, because our capability to detect uh, the uh, paradise waves are very recently developed. So I, I, in this talk, I will try to give you more backgrounds uh, on the technique and also on our uh, more recent studies on another transition metal dash occlusion net, which is a lot more conventional now in the SNN, just to set the stage so that you can understand our preliminary data on, on, on UT2 a little bit better. So, so uh, as you see, the title involves the detection of uh, uh, electron pair crystals. Uh, as you are used to, this means the pair density, wave, pair density waves and also uh, electron pair fluids that are just superfluids uh, that lives in superconductors. So we are trying to figure out how do we visualize them and how do we look at their uh, uh, properties. So uh, electron pair fluid, I think most of you are familiar with. I won't spend too much time on this. So uh, it's a macroscopic quantum state. So you get uh, a macroscopic wave function uh, where you have a, a amplitude that is proportional to the square root of the density of the Cooper pairs n here. Um, at the ground state, the superinductor has this uh, superinductivity condensate at zero energy, and then you will have these excitations uh, at the non-zero energies. And uh, I will say that a conventional uh, STM will just pro pro uh, uh, probe the causal particles at uh, non-zero energy. So we need some other means to probe the uh, condensate itself at zero energy. So if we want to visualize the superfluid, uh, we really want to visualize itself instead of the causal particles. So because it's a fluid, uh, uh, it obeys, for example, the continuity equation. Uh, and also you can easily get a superfluid density by just taking the uh, modular square of the uh, uh, wave function. So the flowing superfluid in super, uh, in type two superconductors are very well known, for example, around the uh, uh, vortices or on the surface, the maximum current. But really there hasn't been any good way to image them down to the very small scale, like a nano or atomic scale. So, that's what I'm gonna show at the end of the talk. Uh, the other one, electron pair crystals, um, <clears throat> the cool pair density wave states. Uh, this problem are more interesting to the audience. Uh, uh, by definition, it uh, is a modulation in the superfluid density. Locally, how many pairs you have and how does it vary? Those are the quantities we try to measure experimentally. Formally, you can write a pair density wave or the superfluid density modulation in this way. It has a amplitude and a a, a sinusoidal, uh, sinusoidal modulation in space with the wave vector QP. Uh, QP means uh, the Q for the parent wave state. And uh, apparently you can create uh, such uh, uh, exotic states by applying very high uh, magnetic field. Uh, this is the famous FFIO state where, where you split the Fermi surface uh, composed of different uh, spin species. And now if you induce pairing uh, for, the, uh, for the singular case, you will have to induce a non-zero center of mass momentum in the Cooper pair. So in this case, the, um, the energy gap itself being uniform in a you know, traditional S-wave superconductor, your, uh, your, uh, your gap will be modulated as same wave vector as your, um, uh, as your uh, Cooper pair momentum. So, so, so the energy gap will be modulated as a, a sinusoidal function as well. Uh, another possibility to have such a pair density wave is that you can introduce some intro valley pairing. Uh, for example, in uh, transition metal dash occlusionized the um, spin valley uh, <clears throat> interactions you will lead to this uh, 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 breaking degeneracy, mostly in the uh, in the valence band of the TMDs. So if you look at the monolayer, and uh, it's possible that uh, you dope the material slightly. P type so that you can uh, favor uh, a sort of inter uh, intra value pairing. So because the K and K prime values are not at uh, gamma, uh, your cooler pairs will have a effective momentum of uh, 2K or 2K prime, uh, which is equivalent to K. So uh, anyway, the cooler pair will have non-zero momentum if you indeed have intra value pairing in this case. So this is a, a, a 
a recent uh, prediction by my colleague at Notre Dame. Uh, so <clears throat> that's uh, what I talk about here are really the fundamental uh, paradigms with meaning they are the real uh, fundamental orders that are primary in your material in a superconductor. But you can also have an induced paradigms wave. Uh, we call it composite paradigms wave. Uh, this comes from the very phenomenal logical Ginsburg-Landau theory, uh, where if you have a superconductor, a, a strong superconductor, uh, and also a coexisting charge order, let's say a charge density wave, you can have, have a spin density wave as well, but uh, let's consider a charge density wave. Uh, so Ginsburg-Landau theory tells you that uh, uh, you can effectively induce a pair density wave state. Uh, we use a del P to induce the order, and uh, del P can be non-zero, so that uh, the collinear terms, so coupling the three orders, uh, can be finite, and your prefactor lambda can be negative to make the free energy lower. So, so del P, a non-zero del P will be a uh, will be uh, preferred. That means you can induce a, a paradigm wave by the coupling of uniform supernativity with a a, a charge density wave. So this is what, what what we mean by composite paradigm waves. So in this case, the induced pair density wave would be modulating at the same wave vector as your charge density wave. Uh, so as shown in this graph, and uh, as a result, your because you still have a uniform uh, uh, superconductivity uh, component like delta not present, uh, your superfluid density will be also modulating at the same wave vector as your uh, modulated gap. So those are uh, modulation uh, in the in the supernativity gap and the modulation in the superfluid density are the two signatures uh, of a pair density wave that we try to detect ex experimentally. So those, uh, this is just one uh, scenario uh, in this, those in intertwined orders. Uh, there are many different uh, uh, possibilities. The one I talk about is really you have a, a primary charge density wave and you can in induce a secondary pair density wave with the same wave vector, but in the other way, like it incorporates in the vortex halos, you can have a primary paradigm wave and uh, somehow you couple it with itself or couple it with the uh, uh, D-wave supernativity, you can use secondary charge waves uh, with Q or double the Q vector. Um, but uh, today we are gonna focus on uh, mostly uh, the one on the bottom. We are inducing a secondary paradigm wave by coupling uh, CDW with supernativity. Okay, so in terms of visualization, uh, supernativity is a superfluid itself. Uh, to visualize superfluid, we know for neutral superfluid, there have been many ways you can visualize directly with your naked eye, uh, or uh, if you do some molecular tagging without signature, essentially you create some excimers in uh, superfluid helium, uh, you can just uh, visualize uh, their fluorescence and track uh, the motions of the particles, or uh, most straightforward way is that you, you can put some uh, uh, particles in your superfluid and uh, track their positions so you can induce the flow field uh, uh, of your fluid. Uh, if you want to go to higher resolution, you can use some scanning probe techniques. Um, and all of this mostly based on uh, reconstructing the flow from the measured magnetic field or, or flux. For example, you can use scanning energy center uh, uh, magnetometry where it measures uh, uh, the magnetic field directly and you can reconstruct uh, the flow. For example, in this case is in a graphing device. So where the electron is flowing, you can see their flow lines by measuring the magnetic field distribution. Or you can measure the flux as in uh, scanning squid microscopy. Uh, this is some edge states in a quantum power device. Okay, so now the question is, uh, how do we visualize them uh, down to the very small scale? Because uh, as I've elucidated to you, the pair dense waves uh, will happen at the same wave vector as the char dense waves, which is on the order of uh, several lattice constants. So even though there are these scanning probe techniques, their resolution, spatial resolution are limited to hundreds or a hundred nanometers at least. So how do we really visualize the superfluid flow and this pair dense wave states uh, down to the atomic level? And this boils uh, down to the question of how do we visualize uh, the superfluid density and the velocity field uh, of the superfluid with atomic resolution. In that case, uh, we can simply calculate the uh, superfluid uh, current J in this way. So uh, the technique we use is called a scan Joseon-Italian uh, microscopy. 
in a normal SCM, you are uh, you use a normal metal tip so that you can pick up a, a, a single electron tunneling. You look at the Cauchy particles directly, but uh, if you use a supernatium probe in our uh, SJTM, uh, we cannot directly uh, access the cool pairs, the condensate itself. So we can measure locally how many pairs we have. So how it works is that uh, when we have a Joseph junction, your uh, wave functions of the two supernatums will couple to each other. Um, each of the wave function will be characterized by a uh, amplitude uh, square root of the superfluid density on each side, and also their quantum phase. Uh, what dominates the behavior of this Joseph junction is the phase difference, and of course it's uh, 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 amplitude ij, which is the uh, <coughs> Josephson critical current. So what it means is that uh, if the phase across the uh, Joseph junction uh, is del theta, your current will be given by this equation. But this phase difference del theta can be a function of time. It can evolve with time if your junction has a non-zero junction voltage VGJ over here. So if your VGJ is non-zero, your del theta will begin to evolve with time. Uh, so your current through the junction will actually be evolving with time. Uh, in other words, if your VGJ is maintained at zero, your del theta will be a, a, a constant number. Your current will not be changing. Uh, in any ways, uh, you, you can, uh, Come, coming from this uh, ambigocker Baratov relationship, you can know that the critical Josephson current multiplied by the uh, Rn, the junction resistance in the normal state, will be proportional to the square root of the superfluid density product. Uh, so the product is uh, the sample and the tip. So if we can assume the tip, our scanning, uh, scan Josephson tunnel microscopy tip has a uh, uniform superfluid density, we can measure IJ and RN, then we can get NS. But the, the problem, key problem is that how do we measure IJ? RN is something readily measurable in our experiment, but how do we measure IJ? Well, this comes down to how do we really model the Joseph junction in our experiment? Uh, there are two regimes of operation. One is uh, the phase coherent regime, the other is the phase diffusive regime, depending on the temperature and how does the temperature, the thermal fluctuation KT, compares with the uh, Joseph energy EJ, which is proportional to the uh, uh, critical current IJ. So in our case, we do our experiments at uh, 300 mini Kelvin and our probe typically, uh, in, in our case, is an albium tip, uh, has a uh, energy gap around one mini electron volt uh, and given a very small junction resistance of one mega ohm, which is uh, three orders uh, smaller than typical STM uh, operation. Uh, so that uh, our maximum EJ is only three micro electron volts, way smaller than KTS 300 milli K. So we are really operating at the phase diffusive regime where your thermal excitations will make the phase randomly fluctuating. And if you apply a finite bias, uh, the phase will be uh, doing a bias random work. So, uh, so of course the phase will be changing with time. So our VJ, VJJ will be non-zero. And uh, the IBA characteristics is schematically shown like this. Your current will reach a maximum. This is, uh, by the way, the paratonic current, the Josephson current. Uh, your current will be non-zero or at maximum at a, a, a finite voltage we call it VC. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the Tallinn process at the VC is such that the electron pair has to lose some energy uh, and in, the, in the form of emitting photons. Uh, so this is why this is called inelastic Josephson Tallinn. So in this uh, curve, we can describe it. Uh, uh, we can describe it using this equation. So the IV characteristic is given here, and if you de uh, if you simply do the first derivative and uh, look at the zero bias, we get the zero bias differential conductance. We say it is proportional to the maximum current at V C. So the maximum Josephson current, and uh, uh, if you compare I M uh, with this equation, you see that I M is proportional to the uh, intrinsic critical current of the Joseph junction, IJ squared. So uh, from the last slide, we saw that uh, IJRM product is proportional to the square root of superfluid density. Uh, now we can rewrite the superfluid density using uh, J naught, which is proportional to IM, and IM is proportional to IJ squared. So we can rewrite NS as, as J naught multiplied by RN squared. And J naught is just a zero bias differential conductance. We can measure, uh, we measure all the time in STM. And the RN is also the uh, junction resistance we can measure uh, at a relatively high voltage beyond the supernativity gap. So those two quantities are readily measurable so that we find a way to measure the superfluid density. 
All right, so uh, like I said, I want to give you a background on our uh, data before we go into UT2. So this is our first study, try to uh, measure power density waves down to the atomic scale. Uh, this is after the search of, uh, or the detection of uh, power density waves in cuprates, which are really utilizing uh, uh, tips that are not atomic sharp. So we can't really see at the atomic level, the, the, the structures, but now we, uh, we were able to create a supernatant atomic sharp Nelvium tips for this study. So uh, the first material we look at is, of course, Nelvium dacyanide. It's uh, uh, well studied. It's very robust in superconductivity. It has a high uh, critical temperature for charge density waves. Uh, so charge density waves is well known to be a, a fundamental order. So by our ginsburg landau analysis, we think the charge density wave and the superconductivity will give us a induced power density wave. Uh, so that's uh, our goal, to search for the signatures of such power density waves. So, <clears throat> Uh, first thing we do is that we look at the surface. It's uh, pretty fast. This is, by the way, done by using a superconducting Nelvium tip. So the resolution is pretty high. It's atomic. Uh, and also, you know the tip is superconducting by looking at uh, the uh, DIDV spectrum. Once you use a superconducting tip, the first thing you get is that you, you, you uh, will increase the size of the uh, superconductivity gap in your spectrum, which is indeed the case. But now if you zoom into the zero bias region, you can look at uh, the current uh, or the DIDV uh, spectral to show this characteristic in acidrosal and tunneling uh, signatures. So we know our tip is definitely superconducting, and we can measure G0, the zero bias conductance, directly from locking measurements. And uh, it varies as a function of your uh, uh, junction resistance to RN, as expected, because our superconductors are not changed, but our RN is changed, our G0 has to change. Okay, so uh, before we move on to the actual measurements of the superfluid density to look for power density waves, uh, we do uh, a few sanity checks. First of it, uh, first of all, uh, is that uh, we want to know uh, whether our G0 is proportional to IM as we derive from the uh, 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 characteristics of the IV curve I showed you previously. That's theoretical, but let's measure it. Uh, we measure G0 and IM from the spectrum. Uh, so one is from the IVIC measurements, the other is the DIDV measurement. These two are independent because the second is done by locking measurements and they are indeed linear. So this checks. Uh, the other is the Cocker baratop relationship and this is also a relatively straightforward check. Um, it's also give you a linear relationship as expected. Uh, so our model seems to be correct, at least in, in terms of modeling the Josephson junction. So now we look at the uh, charge density wave first, and this is well established. We just look at the field states of the uh, sample. It tells you the local charge density. So we measure at uh, some negative, uh, some large negative bias, negative 30 mini electron volt. This gives us uh, uh, the charge density. This is uh, uh, corresponding to the charge density waves, which are given by the, uh, you see these six peaks uh, labeled as the red uh, circles in the Fourier transform. So this is well known. This is a one uh, three unit cell charge density wave, uh, which is locally commensurate but globally incommensurate in Albion dacyanide. Now uh, we can look at uh, the bias, uh, the DIDV uh, or the IV curve uh, at a biases away from the uh, superconductivity gap, which is around uh, two to three millilatron volt. The reason is that we want to extract uh, our normal state resistance of the junction. So in this energy range, let's say between negative five and negative three millilatron volt, uh, the curves are pretty linear. So we have this ohmic behavior. So we can just take the slope to get to the RN. Uh, so these curves correspond to different uh, uh, junction resistance values. Now we can uh, measure the junction resistance at each pixel in a 2D uh, uh, region. This, by the way, is the exact same field of view as our charge density wave map. So we can uh, measure RN spatially with uh, very high spatial resolution. Uh, just know that uh, this image has uh, 1500 pixels on each side. Now <clears throat> we can now lower the, the, the energy to zero by as I look at the Joseph and Tanya signatures. Remember we want to measure two quantities, J0 and RN to get the, uh, the superfluid density. So when we look at J0, uh, we measure by Joseph and Tanya uh, and we can map out J0 R uh, uh, in the same exact same field of view. So with those information, uh, G0 RN images, we can uh, calculate the superfluid density as we showed. 
And this is a superfluid, a total superfluid density. This comes from any paradigm sweep plus the uniform S sweep supernativity. So if you do a Fourier transform, of course, you'll see uh, the black peaks, but also uh, six peaks are uh, arising uh, at the position is very close to the charge dense waves. And actually, we will show it's exactly at the charge dense wave positions, and those peaks correspond to the paradigm wave peaks. Um, now, if we do an inverse Fourier transform, if you look at uh, their signatures, uh, their structures in real space, you can see their periodicity looks very similar. Uh, but uh, their spatial patterns look uh, quite different, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But anyway, we were able to uh, visualize the first signature of uh, a paradigm wave, a modulation of the superfluid density as the wave vector of your charge density wave. Uh, now we want to do another sanity check is that uh, uh, we said this induced charge, this induced paradigm wave is due to the coupling of CDW and uh, superconductivity. Uh, from Ginsburg Landau. So that means if we kill superconductivity, let's say inside the vortex, uh, we should be able to kill the uh, paradigm wave. So this is what, what we did. We map out the superfluid density, the total superfluid density around the vortex. Uh, and we, for example, we extract a lamp profile, we can see the superfluid density goes down almost to zero to the vortex core center as expected. But on top of this uh, uh, gradual change, there is this wiggles, and this wiggles correspond to the paradigm waves. Now, if you filter out this background of the decaying uh, uniform superfluid, we can see the decaying uh, oscillations of the paradigm waves, meaning that the paradigm wave oscillation is going to zero at the vortex core. This is expected. Uh, when you kill superlative, you no longer have induced uh, paradigm wave. Okay, so now we want to search for the second signature of the uh, paradigm wave in this material. Um, that is the energy gap or the parent amplitude modulation uh, spatially. Uh, <clears throat> this we, uh, we were able to achieve using a, our super Latin tip uh, again. Uh, because of the, uh, uh, the gap in the super Latin tip, your Fermi Dirac distribution at zero energy really doesn't uh, smear out your, uh, your peaks in your, uh, in, your, in your tip. So you can, uh, by convolution with the sample, you can really increase the energy resolution. And that's how we can uh, extract a very small uh, uh, energy gap modulation. So in this case, we just perform the spectroscopy imaging at each pixel on the surface and uh, try to uh, extract the energy gap. And the, this image is a map of the energy gap. If you do a Fourier transform, uh, clearly, you can see modulations as the paradigm wave, uh, wave vectors. And if you do a land cut along one uh, direction and uh, just look at the, the uh, total coherence peak, you can see clearly the peak position is modulating at the uh, at the uh, amplitude of around twenty micro electron volt. Again, this is really enabled by uh, our super Latin tip, which by convolution increases our effective energy resolution. So with this data, we were able to uh, see the second the signature of a paradigm wave that is uh, energy gap modulation. But now we have two independent measurements. We can do even better uh, uh, quantitatively. So <clears throat> we want to compare these two uh, independent measurements. Uh, one is measuring the uh, causal particle gap, uh, <clears throat> which is from energies away from zero. Uh, the other is that we can measure the, uh, uh, the condensate itself. This is measuring the superfluid density by taking uh, the Josephson, uh, by measuring the Josephson tunnel current. So those two are independent measurements. Um, but because the superfluid density, total superfluid density is proportional to the square of the uh, energy gap, uh, we can uh, establish uh, a correlation. So um, from each side, we can derive how much of the energy PDW energy gap modulation is compared to your uh, uniform supernativity gap. And uh, from both measurements using our uh, independent data, we can get uh, uh, two numbers that are very similar, on the, at least on the same order. Not exactly the same, but uh, uh, very close. So this gives us confidence that our measurements uh, are uh, at least correct. Now we want to address why the, uh, the atomic scale, their structures look quite different. So what we performed is a, a, a spatial phase extraction using a so-called 2D locking method. So the spatial phase is defined as this. Uh, so both the charts and the pair density waves are composed of three waves in three directions. So these images are just added up images of the three waves individually. 
But for each wave in each direction, you can define a, a modulation amplitude and also a, a wave vector and its phase. And this phase uh, for each of the wave is what we try to extract. Um, so from our data, we can extract the, the three phases for charge dense waves and the three phases for the pair dense wave. Now, if we look at uh, only one of the phases, let's say uh, 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 Q1, we look at the charge dense wave, we can see that uh, it shows some distribution and the most apparently there seems to be a triangular domain. Um, for charge dense wave, this is well understood in the 1980s. Um, this is just a, a disk maturation domain loss. There is a uh, two power over three phase slip. Uh, in each domain, the charge dense wave is actually commensurate with your lattice. Um, but if you look at the pair dense wave, it seems like there is a very similar um, uh, distribution of the phase and the domain shape looks also very similar. But this is only uh, true if two power over three is subtracted from the phase of the pair dense waves, right? So what this tells us is that at the atomic level, by the way, the shown here are experimental data. Uh, but filter out for each individual uh, pair and the charge dense wave. It tells us that uh, uh, at the atomic level, there is a one lattice displacement uh, in terms of the peak of the charge and pair dense waves. So the blue is the pair dense wave, as you can see, is, is displaced by one lattice uh, from the charge dense wave. Uh, just to remind you, the charge and pair dense waves, uh, each of them has uh, a period of periodicity of three uh, three units, three lattice constants. So that tells us the phase difference between charge and pair dense waves uh, is just two pi over three. So this is uh, what you see over here. Or what this implies is this is uh, is this one lattice uh, charge uh, and the pair uh, disjunction. So this is true uh, uh, statistically if we measure the uh, phase difference for uh, all three wave vectors and we plot them uh, in a histogram. You can see it centered around two pi over three. Uh, this uh, has been puzzling us for a while, and uh, recently we were uh, we were still uh, trying to work out uh, the fundamental mechanism, why there is a phase difference, and uh, uh, it seems like uh, from simple arguments, it, it may come from the fact that experimentally, our uh, charge dense wave domains they always have a two pi over three phase difference of one wave compared to the other two, and uh, in this case, if you assume this is true. Uh, it seems like you can always get a two pi over three phase difference between pair and the charge dense wave if you uh, try to minimize uh, uh, the free energy. <clears throat> okay, now it comes to the uh, uh, uranium telluride. Uh, I think Naomi Dasana gives uh, a, a good uh, demonstration of the methodology we used and also the way we analyze data. Now for UTE2, uh, we were really motivated by its unconventional superconductivity. Uh, uh, probably P wave, but uh, more directly, we are motivated by uh, uh, a possibility of a charge dense wave uh, order in this material. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> while we are studying it, there is a, uh, a, a preprint from VDS group uh, where they see this very interesting uh, and puzzling anomalous field sensitive charge dense waves uh, in uranium telluride. So, uranium telluride, um, uh, okay, I will just uh, discuss their data first. So uh, in their data, it, it appears that uh, at a different uh, magnetic field, if you look at the Fourier transforms of the a, a DIDB maps, where it shows the charge density, uh, you can see uh, three peaks emerging. Uh, they are different from the black peaks, which are all there. I will show you more clearly in the next slide. Uh, but those peaks uh, assigned as charge dense wave peaks. Uh, will change their intensity as a function of a magnetic field, which is very bizarre because you don't imagine uh, this uh, field sensitive charge dense waves in, in, in normal case. It's possible that uh, this could be a charge dense wave induced by spin density waves, but uh, um, that's another discussion. Uh, but anyway, it's interesting in itself that uh, the CDW is field sensitive. Um, and you can see it more clearly from there. Beautiful data where you see the uh, cross section, uh, sorry, the line profile across each of the points change uh, intensity very clearly uh, depending on the field. Okay, so uh, the charge dense wave uh, exists in UT2 and also it's incommensurate. Uh, and UT2 itself is a super matter below around 1.6 Kelvin. So, so the uh, charge dense wave does not exist, right? I mean, I mean well, at least not, not in bulk, hasn't been proved in bulk, right? This is only the surface. 
video sees it, you know, on the STM. Yes, yes. Uh, the charge answer, it could be a surface. Yeah, yeah. but it's not, it's not probed. Uh, yeah, uh, scattering techniques didn't prove this in the box. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you, yeah. Said, you, said, you said it's been proven. Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, at least uh, uh, I will say this is a surface effect. That's what we know from STM data. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I should clarify that. It's definitely not established this, uh, there is a bulk charge density. Okay, experiments, we try to uh, uh, look at uh, uh, the possible induced parallels within this crystal. Uh, the thing is the UT2 cleaves, uh, it's uh, uh, not a very venomous material, meaning that you cannot cleave it uh, very easily. Uh, but again, uh, but uh, luckily you can cleave it along the 011 cleave surface, not a C axis, but 011. Uh, the exposed surface uh, looks like this. You will have chains of uranium uh, and tellurium atoms. And if you image it in our uh, STM at 300 mini K, we see these chains of tellurium. And uh, if you zoom in, there are two chains of tellurium. They correspond to the tellurium one and tellurium two atoms. So there are two types of uh, tellurium on the surface. So this light and the dark blue tellurium atoms. So this is from topo image. The crystal is. Uh, pretty high car, uh, quality, even though there are still some uh, point defects, which are intrinsic. So the point defects, are they coming from uh, uranium or are they coming from tellurium? Um, from their locations, it looks like uh, uh, they are coming from uranium because they do not, I mean, you, there are, for example, this defect it seems to sit on the tellurium side. Mm -hmm. So I would think it's from tellurium, but there are many other defects that seem to be uh, like uh, in between uh, the two tellurium atoms, but we can't really say for sure. Uh, so I would just guess it's coming from uranium as well, but uranium is subsurface. Uh, so it's kind of uh, hard to uh, detect a defect there. Um, okay, thank you. But I, I can't imagine this different, many different kinds of defects only come from tellurium because there are only two types of tellurium on the surface. Okay. Yeah. Okay. so. Uh, so what we do is that uh, we image, we select the field of view uh, large enough so that we can look at their Fourier transforms. Um, <clears throat> so we select a field of view and uh, again, we use a, a an LVM tip, by the way, uh, in this case. But uh, we keep the temperature at 4K. So we look at the surface. In this case, the uh, crystal is not super melting. And we look at uh, uh, the energy, oh, by the way, the energy gap is only uh, uh, around 0.25 million electron volts. So if you try to image at uh, 10 million electron volt, we are way beyond the energy gap. So we are really measuring the quality particle densities. So if you look at 10 million electron volts, it tells us that, uh, the charge distribution. And if you take a Fourier transform down here and compare it with the topo, we see very clearly the bright peaks. The bright peaks are those uh, uh, orange circles because this on the, in, in STM, it's just a distorted uh, 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 triangular lattice. So you have this distorted hexagon in the Fourier transform. Um, but in the, uh, in the uh, Fourier transform of the DIDV, you'll see more clearly the appearance of these three peaks in agreement with the VDS uh, study where they see these uh, three charges with uh, vectors. Uh, I have to note that uh, these three uh, wave vectors are not independent and in fact, uh, only one of them is uh, independent because you can correlate them uh, with a wave vector of the uh, reciprocal space. So uh, there might just be one uh, independent uh, uh, charge density in this case. But anyway, we try to analyze three independently. So I say it's an incommensurate charge density wave because if you zoom in this a little bit and measure the distance, for example, a uh, very straightforward way that uh, uh, it tells you that the distance is uh, not one half or anything. So it's very incommensurate. So this is uh, different than the uh, locally commensurate charge density wave in Nelbium design. Okay, so as I said, the, the energy gap of uh, our UT2 crystal with TC around 1.6 Kelvin is around 0.25 uh, mini electron volt. So this is uh, our raw DIDV spectrum. Uh, this is uh, well known that it has a very, not well known, but established that it has a very high residual density of six at zero uh, at 3.3 Kelvin. Um, the two uh, coherence peaks are not very obvious, but you can obvi uh, you can kind of see that they, they lie in between zero and 0.25. So, okay. I thought, I thought the yeah. recent measurement uh, suggesting that if you have a TC of a higher, you know, TC sample, like two Kelvin sample, then 
the heat capacity normally at the low temperature is uh, severely suppressed. I mean, ha have you tried that, uh, Crystal? Uh, oh, we don't have. You, you mean the anomaly at zero bias? The density yeah, 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 will be yeah, lower. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I don't know that uh, data. Okay, interesting. But yeah, we, we don't have the uh, we don't have the two Kelvin <laughs> sample. So okay, okay, right. Now that would be interesting to try actually. So we are also puzzled by what, what what's giving this density of seeds mm -hmm. in the gap. Okay, so immediately you can see that the energy gap, the coherence peaks are very um, weak, and it's hard to define where they really are. So measuring them will give us a very high uncertainty. So. <clears throat> so we try to use a superinducting tip. By the way, this is NS tunneling N means using a normal tip. Uh, now we try to use a superinducting tip again, Nelbium. Uh, this is a special showing uh, why Nelbium tip will, 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 will kind of enhance the energy resolution because this is Nelbium tunneling to a Nelbium crystal. You can see super sharp uh, current peaks. And when we do this on, uh, on UTE2, so this is Nelbium tip measured on UT2, you'll see uh, uh, now a very clear uh, coherence peak. And those coherence peak is the sum, it allows us to measure the gap, which is the sum of the uh, Nelvium tip gap plus the gap of the uh, uh, of UT2. Okay. And uh, because we know the gap of the tip is not changing, uh, especially when we're scanning, so we can uh, figure out what is the gap modulation of the, uh, of the UT2. So, uh, so uh, down here, we again select the field of view. We, we do very high resolution topographic imaging, but in the existing field of view with the same pixel density, we can measure uh, uh, the full spectrum at each position, like shown here in the SIS uh, geometry. And from there, uh, we can measure the total energy gap. Uh, so what is shown here is delta, delta. So it means the, uh, uh, the energy gap minus the spatial average energy gap. So it tells you uh, modulations. So if you do a Fourier transform of this, uh, you see uh, clearly the, um, uh, the black peaks, but also the pair density peaks at positions. Uh, I didn't show it, but uh, uh, you can tell it's uh, basically identical to the pair density waves. Okay. So uh, similar to our uh, methods of analyzing our uh, PDW in Albion, the net, we can do an inverse Fourier transform to look at the charge and pair uh, modulations. Uh, this is the inverse Fourier transform for the, char for the uh, charge density waves. By the way, this, this is a superposition of the three uh, waves, uh, the three wave vectors. And similarly, it's true for the pair modulations in the gap. Uh, now, if you draw, draw a LAMP profile, we can clearly see their phase modulation. Their modulation seems to be out of phase. Okay, instead of 2 pi over 3 for an the design, at this time, they seem to be pi out of phase. And this is more obvious seen by statistically measuring their distribution. So you can see this is anti-correlation between the gap measurements, uh, gap modulation, and the uh, uh, charge density wave itself. Um, uh, <clears throat> so now it comes to the question. Uh, we didn't assume this is a pair density wave that is induced by the charge density wave, but we try to uh, uh, answer this question, what kind of pair density wave this is. Uh, so VDS data shows that uh, there is a phase sensitive or a fuel sensitive charge density wave. Uh, one possibility uh, uh, proposed is that uh, the charge density wave is induced by a pair density wave, a more primary pair density wave in UT2. Um, so of course, if you go, uh, uh, if you apply field, you kill the pair density, you will kill the uh, charge density. Wave. So you can do some field sensitivity there. But uh, the other possibility is uh, the same as in Ibm the Sana, where you have primary charge density inducing this pair density. Wave. So which one is the case? Uh, um, and to answer this question, uh, we look at uh, the experimental facts in UT2, uh, at least the surface charge density wave. Uh, is detectable up to 10 Kelvin, and it uh, happens uh, on the 10 mini electron volt energy scale. So in fact, if you vary the sample bias uh, plus minus 10 or 20 mini electron volts, you can still see signatures of the charge modulation. But for the pair dense wave, uh, we were not able to detect it at 4 Kelvin when the material is not uh, superinducting. And also the, uh, the modulation amplitude is on the order of 10 micro electron volt. So for the first case will happen where you have a pair density wave inducing a model, uh, fundamental pair density wave inducing a charge density wave. It requires you to have a 10 micro electron volt pair density wave inducing a 10 mini electron 
uh, energy scale uh, uh, charge density, which seems not very possible, especially if you can't detect pair density with above uh, four Kelvin. But the other way around is that you have a charge sense wave that has 10 milli electron volt energy skill inducing a 10 micro electron volt uh, pair dense wave uh, when the sample is super natural, seems more uh, uh, likely. So, so this is so far uh, our sending of the pair dense wave in this material, we were able to detect it. But, uh, and as, uh, as to the origin, we tend to believe this is uh, not a fundamental pair dense wave, but uh, the one induced by the charge dense wave. Okay, um, any questions on this part? Otherwise I will move on to the uh, superfluid uh, part. Okay, yeah, so, so, I, so do, do, I mean, if there's a charge density wave, I guess the, the obvious question is, so what's the charge density of ordering temperature, right? Right, right, uh, we haven't been able to do, uh, uh, so this 10 Kelvin is, uh, uh, is shown by, by video. Um, okay. I, I don't think there's a, there's more detailed study on the on the te temperature. Uh, we were not able to vary temperature uh, by a lot, so we have we don't have data on this yet. But, but what happens when you turn on the magnetic field? Did you confirm video's result? No, we uh, that's 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 ongoing. Uh, I don't know whether Seamus is around, but that's ongoing at Cornell. Okay. Okay. Uh, JP, you have a question? Yeah. Hi. Um, so hey. a quick question, just about. Uh, bulk versus surface nature of this phase. Does this um, primary versus secondary scenario still hold if it's just the surface effect or conversely if it's bulk? Um, so when you have the ginsburg landau uh, written out, it's a free energy of the total bulk crystal. So I would imagine if something only happens at the surface, the gain in free energy will be pretty low compared to if it happens everywhere. Uh, but still, it lowers the free energy. So I would think this uh, primary versus secondary argument still holds uh, if it's only surface. Okay, thanks. No problem. Any other questions for, for, for Xiao Long? Okay, you can, you can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thanks uh, for the great questions. Um, so now uh, talking about uh, the superfluid. So <clears throat> as I said, it, there should be superfluid flowing around the uh, uh, vertices on the surface of a supernatural in, in, in a magnetic field. But uh, the question is uh, how do you visualize them? Uh, and uh, for a lot of supernatural, their uh, penetration depth is relatively small. Uh, you want to use some very uh, 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 local probe to measure them with high spatial resolution. So. In this case, we still try to use our super uh method. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of a vortex, the superfluid around the vortex uh, can be written out as this, where you have the superfluid flowing, uh, and uh, because you have a, a phase winding theta here, uh, it tells you the superfluid must be non-zero. Uh, and all, of course, because this is a quantum vortex, the phase has to go back to uh, uh, two pi, or it has to circulate uh, by uh, n times two pi. So because of this uh, uh, quantization requirement, you have this flexor uh, quantization requirement where your normal flux plus a term due to the flow should be n times of the flux quantum. So those are the known facts, very well known facts for uh, at least every cause of vortices in supernatures. Okay, now how do we visualize superfluid? Uh, velocity, and we utilize a phenomenon that uh, we are all familiar with, that is the Doppler effect. Um, a do in a Doppler effect, if your source of the wave is moving, the energy or frequency you detected uh, will be different from in the rest frame of the source. Uh, as for example, in this case, you use a radar gun to measure the speed of the car, that's well known. Uh, but in terms of flowing superfluid, the same can, can be applied here. Uh, in the resting frame of your superfluid, you will have this symmetric uh, energy or the dispersion, these red curves, right? You have this uh, uh, same gap on both sides. But uh, if you have, uh, if you try to now look at the uh, quasi particle bands uh, in a lab frame where the fluid is flowing, your uh, energy uh, or your quasi particle energy will actually be shifted. By a term that is that's what we call the Galilean energy boost, which is hk uh, dot vs. So this energy boost is proportional to the velocity of the superfluid. So if you have a larger velocity of the superfluid, your energy uh, uh, correction will be larger. So 
uh, reflected to the cosmic particle spectrum, you can see these blue curves. One side goes down, but the other side goes up. And uh, uh, but I have to uh, uh, measure this. This happens also uh, symmetrically on both sides. So how much this goes down, the other side also goes down. So it's not like the gap is closing on one end. Uh, but if you measure in the left frame the uh, density of cis of the cosmic particles, instead of two coherence peaks, you will see some broadening effects. Uh, of the uh, superconductivity uh, current peak as shown here schematically. So <clears throat> this gives us a means to measure uh, how much the energy, uh, kinetic energy boost is, and then we can try to figure out what is the flowing uh, speed of the superfluid. Okay, so our technique is uh, uh, again, by using a superconducting tip, we try to measure the um, uh, cosmic particle um, uh, density of states. And uh, we model it using the uh, by writing the Green's functions, where your energy E has to be corrected by the Galilean energy boost, which is proportional to the uh, flow speed. And in the density of states, this uh, modification will carry over. And uh, if you can measure the uh, differential conductance, which by the way is a convolution of a superconducting tip density of states, and your modified sample density of states, uh, you can try to figure out what is the uh, energy boost there. Okay, we go back to now beam cyanide, our robust supernatural, and then try to create a, 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 a vortex uh, at a very low magnetic field. And then these vortices will be so far away from each other so you, they can be considered independent. Okay, so now our, uh, we measure our superfluid density uh, using SGTM, uh, like I showed before, but now uh, uh, on top of a vortex. And we can see the total superfluid density. So NCP is a total cool pair density. And it decreases to zero at the vortex cost center because there's no superfluid as expected. Okay, <clears throat> now what we do is that at each position of the uh, superfluid of, of the field of view, we measure a full spectrum like shown on the right. And then we try to fit uh, our quasi particle uh, spectrum by considering two uh, variables. One is a, a uniform supernative gap uh, of the superconductor delta S because as you approach the vortex core, this delta S will decrease. Uh, the other is a variable uh, that we want to extract that's a getting the energy boost, delta EF, delta EKF. So by fitting this, and we use a realistic uh, uh, gap function, which is an anisotropic gap for an album descender. And we fit every single spectrum in this field of view. And this shows three representative spectrum uh, taken at different radius from the center of the vortex. And uh, you can see they evolve. So we fit them and then we can extract our delta EKF as shown here. Um, the little structure at the very vortex call center is an artifact because in our model, we did not consider the uh, bound states that lives within the uh, coherence lens, which is around 10 nanometers. So those are caused by some artifacts, but outside uh, we have pretty good fitting. Okay. With the uh, delta EKF extracted, then we can extract uh, uh, the velocity field uh, of the flowing superfluid around the vortex. And it gives us this pattern. And uh, especially, you can see the fluid uh, velocity goes up to even 3,000 meters per second, which is really fast. And also, the pattern seems to give you a hexagonal shape. And this has been actually proposed a uh, long, long time ago in the 1990s. And uh, this, I think, is the first time this is observed. And then if you can look at the uh, measure the uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, superfluid density, Gs, uh, simply by multiplying Vs by uh, the charge density, N, uh, superfluid density, N, uh, and also uh, 2E. And then we can look at uh, the superfluid, uh, the superfluid, uh, supercurrent density, uh, it decays to zero as expected because you will have no superfluid flowing. Uh, but this is really coming from the fact that the superfluid density at uh, the core is zero. So when you multiply with Vs, you get a, a zero at the center. Okay. So how reproducible is this? This is just one data, but uh, we can try to do the same measurement and the extraction of the velocity field for different vortices and at a different magnetic field. So the previous one is done at uh, uh, 50 millitesla, then we can go to 200 millitesla and measure different vortices and extract their uh, velocity profile and the same to correspond to each other pretty well. So it's definitely reproducible. Uh, but more quantitatively, we can try to compare uh, quantities we can extract from these measurements to known literature values. For example, uh, we can extract the Ginzburg-Landau superfluid density just by fitting the uh, superfluid density function 
and also the the uh, the energy gap as a function of distance, uh, and it gives a, a, a coherence length of uh, uh, around eleven nanometer, very similar to literature values. Uh, but also because now we have the superfluid velocity figured out, uh, we can fit it to the Landon's equation and to figure out the Landon penetration depths, uh, which gives a number almost identical to literature uh, values. So we have pretty good confidence in our measurements. Uh, this is just to show uh, the supercurrent density, which goes to uh, approach zero. We don't have data around here because we want to have cut off the artifacts. Um, for the quantum phase winding, as I said, there is a flux like quantization because now we have all the necessary quantities we need to measure the total uh, flux loid, BDS and MVS. Uh, we can <clears throat> try to measure them and we separate this into two contributions, uh, phi V and uh, phi J, and uh, we, might, uh, we sum them up together, which is this uh, 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 a wet curve or wet dots. It's pretty flat as a function of distance, which means that the flux loid doesn't change as a, a function of radius. This is uh, 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 well expected. And their value is very close to one, uh, not, even though not exactly. And part of the reason is that uh, because we ignored the very center of the core where our model failed, uh, we may lose some flux, uh, or some flux was not taken into account uh, when we're calculating the flux loid. But again, this tells us the flux loid. Uh, seem to be true. It's around uh, one uh, flux quantum, and that also means our uh, quantum phase is really uh, a one uh, is really uh, one in by two pi, around two pi in this case. So I think this is the first time uh, uh, a confirmation of the phase winding. So now you may wonder the the Doppler effect doesn't really need a, a superinducting tip, and why we are using it. Uh, the reason is this: <clears throat> this is simulated uh, uh, spectral coupling uh, a normal or supernatin tip with a supernatin sample. As you can see, because at zero, at a non-zero temperature, because of the uh, smearing due to uh, um, uh, at zero energy, if you use a, a <clears throat> normal tip, your spectrum will become, in, um, <clears throat> will become very similar and overlap, even though your Galilean energy boost is different. Okay, so you can't even tell the differences at the point three Kelvin, but uh, if you look at uh, the SS tunneling regime, because you avoid the Fermi Dirac smearing at zero energy, you can have very sharp peaks up to one Kelvin. So that's the reason why we choose to uh, use a supernatant tip in this case. So with that, I'd like to uh, summarize that we were able to detect uh, uh, two composite pair density wave states in two uh, materials and uh, um, for each of the material, the pair density waves will exhibit a phase difference with the primary charge order. And, uh, and this also led us to uh, believe that uh, the, the, because of the energy scale of the pair density wave detected in UT2, we believe this pair density wave is an induced pair density wave instead of a, a fundamental one. And uh, really, this tells us that uh, now with this technique, Scandrosa and Talia Microsby, we may. I establish a new paradise wave material library, and those materials they can be either fundamental paradise wave materials or this induced paradise waves. There are many possibilities now, and using our uh, scanning Joseph Tunnel microscopy technique, we can also visualize a superfluid flow in a superinductor. But this is more general uh, to other electron fluids, uh, like in uh, metals where the conductivity is very high. You have a very you have many uh, crash carriers and uh, their flow speed can be up to uh, hundreds of meters per second. So this also uh, gives the possibility of visualization using our uh, um, supernatant tip as Okay, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues, uh, uh, especially uh, our colleagues at Cornell and uh, also our crystal growth for UT2 and also my postdoc advisor, Seamus Davis, uh, even though I am not a professor at uh, uh, Notre Dame, I, those work are uh, really done at uh, Cornell. <clears throat> okay, so I also want to take the opportunity to advertise for our new uh, quantum material center called Stav, uh, called Stav Roffler Center for Complex Quantum Matter. It's really very similar to the RCQM uh, center at the Rice, uh, but it's pretty new and we are trying to make it uh, uh, a great center as uh, RCQM, at least in the near future. 
Uh, we have now uh, four faculty members, um, and our director is Professor Faro leading the efforts. And we are actively recruiting new faculty members, and we'll probably have another four or five coming in a few years. Uh, I also take this to opportunity to, to advertise for my own group, and we have openings for students and postdocs. And uh, as you probably have guess, we work uh, with uh, low temperature STMs, um, and our systems are specialized for different purposes. Uh, for example, one system is specialized for SGTI measurements, and others are for atom manipulation or for MBE growth. Uh, we are interested in all kinds of uh, 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 quantum materials, including superconductors in the bulk or MBE grown thin films. Uh, we also work on 2D heterostructures, especially the Mori superstructures. Uh, and also, we also create a quantum simulators by using uh, STM tip to do atom or molecule manipulation on surfaces. So, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and again for. Um, for uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, very interesting experiment, very interesting talk. Yeah, let me let me uh, take proof to ask you first. So, yeah. so I mean, you, your your technique basically you can can you actually uh, detect both using uh, uh, you know superconducting and non superconducting tip to basically determine the uh, the superfluid density as compared with a normal fluid, you know, in a superconductor. Uh. What do you mean by using a normal tip? Uh, I mean, normal tip were not able to detect the superfluid though. I see. Can, can you actually separate the, the portion of the electrons that are actually superconducting? I mean, with uh, by, by measuring mm -hmm. directly the Cooper pairs? I guess <clears throat> I guess if we use a supernatural tip, we are only sensitive to the uh, Cooper pair. So mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. that case, we are only measuring the superfluid density, not the normal fluid density. For the normal fluid, I don't know whether it's uh, it's okay to call it a fluid because you need enough sure, sure, sure. you need enough carriers to be hydrodynamic. Right? So, uh, but to, as you know, traditionally STM is used to measure the, the charge carrier density in the normal uh, using a normal tip. Um, yeah, but I, I think our supernatural tip just gives us a, another way to or, or a new way to measure the superfluid itself instead of the quality particles. I mean, JP may be able to answer this question. I, mean, I guess I mean in, in the case of your new battery, right? right? Uh, I mean, the, the, do you know the portion of the electron that are actually superconducting in the superconducting state? Hi. Um, well, uh, yeah, well, according to our thermal transport measurements, they're all superconducting. I mean, there's no residual quasi particle transport. Yeah, but I thought I mean, the key capacity shows clearly some density states, right? There must be some. It's not that... itinerant, it's localized. I see. So, so these electrons are not super. I mean, these whatever contributing to that is not superconducting at all. You, in your view, in my view, yeah, it's not. It's not conducting at all, or it's heavily scattered. I see. I see. I see. That's interesting. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, but Pong Chong, yeah, I ask, and uh, now I get your, your question better. Quantitatively, <clears throat> I think. Oh, we haven't tried it, but from even the from the diffusive uh, Grossman tunneling, you can quantitatively calculate. Uh, from your 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 tunneling current, just mm -hmm. current, how much uh, carry how much superfluid density or what's the superfluid density that uh, is contributing to it? I think that's doable, but we we, we were just not able to do it because you know mm -hmm. this, one of the parameters uh, like VC and others they are they are not known. Uh, they are experimental measure, but a lot of other quantities are not known to 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 experimentally quantitatively measure the superfluid density in absolute values. So, so in your uranium dithora result, which I find very interesting. So basically you're saying that the, if the charge density wave is a surface effect, you know, what you see in the pair density wave is just a you know, subsequent effect of this uh, surface effect, right? It may or may not have anything to do with intrinsic you know, bulk superconducting properties, right? Is that, is that what you are suggesting? Uh, uh, I, I would, uh, I, first I, I, I wouldn't know whether the CDW is surface or bulk, but at least it exists on the surface. Uh, right. But if it exists on the surface with the surface CDW, the power density wave, I would think, is a surface uh, power density wave. Because if you don't have power density wave in the bulk, uh, you wouldn't induce it in the same mechanism. Uh, so, but the supernatal, you need supernativity to induce this power density wave. So, unless you think the supernativity on the surface is very different from in the bulk, which it could be, um, I think. Definitely, the PDW is showing you signatures of the uh, supernativity. I, I guess you are driving towards a P wave uh, supernativity right, right. in this material. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, maybe I mean, maybe JP have someone else have some idea. I mean, why why would a P wave superconductor, you know, have uh, anything to do with charge density waves? <laughs> I had no answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. It's very it's a very weird uh, situation just because uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of the I mean, surface the, the, versus bulk nature, but also the fact that the you know, there's some, there's obviously some at least surface based uh, density of states that fills the gap, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in no normal STM measurement. So, how does this all fit together? I have no idea at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, Trudeau, Trudeau has a question. Yeah. Um, hi, John. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I'm cu cu curious. So, the the uh, measurement is done on the 011 cleavage. Yes. But the, the crystal is also possible to cleave in a 001 edge. Have you tried measuring that? Uh, we, uh, we've tried, uh, but we were not able to get a uh, uh, flat enough surface on the, uh, along the C-axis. So- I see. Right. Uh, I, I think it's, it's significantly more difficult to cleave on that direction. That's our experience. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but it would definitely be interesting. I'm, I'm actually trying at another time also the, the cleaving along that direction. Uh, still, it's, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, the other thing is that the UT2 crystals are, at least uh, the ones we work with are relatively small. So um, yeah, it's harder to grip on them and cleave on the C-axis. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so, so Flo Thanks. Florian, you have a question? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, thank you for the hey. talk. Uh, I have a quick question, more basic probably. So if you have a charge density wave and then it's not to me personally, not super surprising that uh, a gap, a superconducting gap is then modulated with that same um, periodicity. Why is that not just, you know, superconductivity in a new unit cell on a charge density wave? Why does that have to be air density wave? And I guess in the similar, maybe <laughs> an aspect of that question is, right? Have you, have you done... Mm -hmm. A similar experiment on just a boring S wave, no charge density wave superconductor, and looked at the spatial profile of the gap. Yeah, for the second question, I think <clears throat> um, you wouldn't get any modulation for sure because if you don't have the charge density wave, right? But you don't. You wouldn't even. I wouldn't be surprised if I saw a gap modulation with the unit cell. In oh yeah, with the unit cell. There, there, there is a modulation. Yes, even as, as even in the gap. In of this case. Mm -hmm. So you'd even in the gap, you'd see a modulation. You think with the in a superconducting gap with the unit cell. Yes, yes, that is a, a obviously thing. But I would uh, say that uh, when you have a charge density wave, <clears throat> um, the symmetry is broken by the charge density wave in the charge, you know, channel. But uh, if you have a induced a pair density wave. We consider it as a new state because, as you said, oh, why, why, when you have a charge density, why not have the gap modulus at the same wave vector? But uh, a new uh, transitional symmetry is broken in the superfluid itself. Now it's broken not only at the the lattice but also at a new order, uh, a new wave vector that is a charge density order. Right. right. So I guess that's why. Well, I yeah. guess the Florence point is that uh, you know, I mean, your charge density will give a new modulation anyhow. <clears throat> It gives you a new unit cell. Yeah, so yeah, if you yeah, see yeah, the yeah. if you see the unit cell in a base in a in a gap in a boring superconductor, you now have a new unit cell that's a charge density wave. But that, that's what Shalom showed, right? His science paper. He basically, you know, his first part of his talk basically show it's identical to the charge density wave wave vector, right? You're, you're modulating. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So I guess my question is then, how can you distinguish? Like, uh, how do we distinguish now between superconductivity that's just modulated with the new unit cell and that's what you'd expect even in, in a boring, non like so boring superconductor. How would you distinguish that from a pair density wave? Does that make sense? So I, I guess in that case, <clears throat> in that case, you are boring new modulation uh, at a new unit vector uh, or you, uh, at a new unit uh, cell would be considered as a pair density, wave, I would say, because as I said, I believe this is a new uh, broken uh, symmetry in the in the superfluid channel, in, not in the charge. So, um, it, and especially in that case, the pair density, the pairing occurs from uh, 
you know, electrons with uh, uh, non-zero momentum, now it becomes Q, uh, the, the charge density wave, wave vector, right? So that's, I would say, not uh, as trivial as the lattice itself. OK. Thank you. OK, yeah. A any other question for him? Yeah, it's a very interesting talk. I mean, did you apply a field? I mean, I guess I ask you this, right? I mean, in, in the, you know, uh, now, now the disalinite, it's very interesting when you apply a field, you see the, you know, changes in superfluid density. I mean, in the, in the uranium ditoride case, did you apply field and see what happens to the, to your charge density wave within, within the vortex? Um, uh, first of all, yes, we tried the experiment. Uh, the difficulty <clears throat> is that uh, the vortex, the vortices are very uh, hard to detect in UT2 because it's very shallow gap. Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, yeah. Norton and I did a neutron scattering experiment to look at both. Oh, we, we, we that's also a week the... of Yeah, we, we waste a, a week of neutron time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, haven't, okay. I haven't checked with him, but uh, okay. yeah, 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 we definitely yeah. tried uh, a Tesla field. Um, okay. But it's very difficult to see the vertices. I think uh, uh, Ali Asani has some data uh, at, uh, at the dilution bridge temperature. They, I think they still barely see the, uh, the vertex core. Uh, it's okay. very difficult. Ilya, yeah. Um, yes, maybe I have a kind of naive question, you know, because in the past, niobium diselenide was considered to be a kind of a classical example of a multiband superconductor. Now, in your talk, uh, you didn't mention at all about this. So it looked like you are more talking about the system as a single band superconductor with, uh, you know, with strongly anisotropic gap. Right, yes. so does it mean yes. that uh, we have a change of uh, paradigm? So you would say no. that like, diselenite is not a multiband superconductor, but simply a strongly mm -hmm. anisotropic superconducting gap? Or how should I uh, view now this? Um, because it also has implication, if it is a still a multiband superconductor, then it would also have an implication for the pair density wave as well. Right, if it's a multiband superconductor, if you know, uh, gaps open on both bands, and uh, yeah, uh, equivalent, you should expect pair density waves induced from both uh, on both bands. Uh, but uh, from this talk, we, as you pointed out, we just use a single band, but anisotropic uh, parameter, other parameter. Um, that's just our way of uh, fitting our data. We our data does not rule out one way or another. It does not suggest this is a single band uh, supernatural. Our data wouldn't uh, say anything about that. Uh, it is just uh, it's convenient for our algorithm to work uh, with one single band and induce the uh, uh, anisotropy there. Equivalently, we can feed the data with two uh, isotropic bands, but with different energy, uh, with different energy gap. Mm -hmm. uh, that also works. It's just that we choose this uh, way to, to, to do the modeling. Right? That's it. Uh, it doesn't tell you whether it's a multi-band or a single band. Okay, very nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, very good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No more questions. Thank you again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>